Hello and welcome to the Oplane podcast, the podcast where we learn about different aspects of the aviation industry by talking with experienced aviation professionals. I feel compelled to start today's episode with a short historical introduction. Just would like you to ask you to look back 80 years in time. Back then, the world was at war, and despite their political and ideological differences, the US and the Soviet Union were fighting on the same side of the conflict. America became, in fact, the arsenal of the world, supplying huge amounts of war material to all fronts of war, including the ones where the Soviets were active. And if you have a quick look at the map, you will see that the US and Russia are literally just a few miles apart from each other. The remote and unforgiving Bering Strait separates Alaska from the far east of Russia. During the war years, thousands of aircraft flew through this region while in transit from their factories in the US to the European War Theater. From Great Falls, Montana, American crews flew those factory new aircraft over the northwest of Canada all the way to Fairbanks, Alaska, where the aircraft were taken over by Soviet crews for the ferry flight to Siberia. This was known as the Alsip route, its name standing, of course, for AL, Alaska, and SIV, Siberia. This was a route that, at the very best of times, was fraught with danger, not from the enemy, but from the extreme weather conditions that often prevailed in these Arctic regions. And... At this point is when our guests today, Jeff Gere and Craig Lang, come into the picture. They are both aviation enthusiasts based in Washington State, and through the Bravo 369 Flight Foundation, they have launched a number of initiatives to recover the memory of this little publicized episode of the Second World War. On two occasions, in 2013 and 2015, they partly retraced the old Alsip route, with a flight of vintage aircraft. Two C-47s, piloted by Russian pilots, did eventually make it all the way to Moscow, where they were exhibited at the 2015 MAX Air Show. This summer, Alsip 2020 was expected to take place, and this time Jeff and Craig had prepared to fly all the way to Siberia while filming a documentary, but the COVID-19 pandemic has of course got in the way. So this project is now postponed until at least the summer of 2021. Nevertheless, I thought it was a good idea to call Jeff and Craig and learn more about this fascinating, unique project that combines aviation, military history, and the unspoiled, wild natural beauty of some of the world's most remote regions. So without further ado, let me welcome to the podcast our two guests today. Hello, Jeff and Craig. How are you? Hello, Miguel. Doing well, thank you. From uh, sunny Washington State this morning. Great. And hello, Miguel. This is Craig, and uh, always good to talk with you. You are also based in Washington State? Yes. Okay, very good. You're near Seattle, or which part of the state are you based in? We're, we're up almost hugging the Canadian border. We're north of Seattle. I heard it's a very beautiful area. I've never been in that area, but definitely one of the places I would like to visit when I go. Well, let, let, Jeff, let Jeff and myself be the first to uh, send you a formal invitation to uh, come visit us in beautiful Washington State. Okay. And I think the best, the best way to see it is by air. So uh, consider yourself uh, having served seed on uh, one of Bravo 369's Warbirds. Okay, well... I'll take you on that. (laughs) (laughs) Any excuse to go flying, Miguel. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) So let me introduce you uh, to our audience. You've been uh, working on a very interesting project that is basically to recreate the old route that aircraft were flying during World War II to supply the Soviet Union through Alaska and then crossing the Bering Straits onto Siberia and all the way to Europe. And you are running, a, how would you call it, a, a rally, an air rally, or from Alaska all the way to, through Siberia and onto Moscow, right? Well, that is correct. And um, partly um, the, the project 
uh, itself is, as you had stated, it, it really is all about the commemoration and the flight recreation uh, during World War II of uh, military aircraft. The United States uh, sent nearly uh, 8,000 military aircraft from the factories to uh, the uh, Soviet Union via Alaska. And so the route really started at the American factories and then the uh, aircraft were staged at Great Falls, Montana. And then an air route called the uh, Northwest Staging Route, which is part of the Alaska-Siberia Air Route, or ALSEB as we tend to refer to it, um, begins at uh, Great Falls, Montana. And it goes up through uh, Alberta, northern BC, across the Yukon, and then into uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. And Fairbanks was the terminus of the American deliveries of these aircraft. And uh, they met the Soviet pilots there uh, in, um, in Fairbanks there at, uh, at Ladd Field uh, for transfer from there across Siberia to uh, Krasnyarsk. And so um, the project, as we have been working on it for several years, we have... Uh, uh, called it ALSEB and ALSEB by year. So ALSEB 2013 was really our first uh, test flight, if you will. And we took um, uh, North American AT-6 Texans, which uh, 54 of those were delivered across the route during World War II. And we flew the test route uh, in, in 2013 just to make sure that, you know, we as pilots and um, and crew, you know, we were up to the up to the challenge, and of course the aircraft themselves being, you know, over 70 years old, and uh, so that was kind of the start. And then, uh, and then 2015, we actually did a, a flight with uh, our Russian flight partner. Uh, they had a, C, a couple of C-47s, and we, uh, we had a couple of T-6s, and, and we flew to uh, uh, Fairbanks and, and met with our, our Russian counterparts there. And then uh, they, they took the flight from there to uh, Krasnyarsk and then uh, eventually to their home base in, in Moscow. So um, what we're doing really, Mikhail, with the project is, is that we, we have a little bit of unfinished business from 2015 and that... Uh, uh, the main thrust of the project is really the documentary film about all of the history and the cooperative effort between the United States and the Soviet Union during World War II. So our final push, which was going to happen this year before you know, COVID-19 hit, um, was to uh, get funding into the project so we could complete the documentary film and do the full flight recreation project with the American crew uh, between the United States and, and Krasnyarsk, Russia. So what's the situation now? It's been, is it still on or you have postponed it? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately we had to postpone the uh, ALSEB 2020 uh, flight. And, and primarily what we were going to do in 2020 was to do um, a commemorative flight uh, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, or as in Russia, as they, they refer to as the Great Patriotic War. So unfortunately, with everything that's going on in the world right now, and, and we had a bit of a funding shortage, we had to postpone the project until next year. So we're, we're really kind of looking at a, a ALSIB 2021, if you will, but the focus is really going to be on the documentary film. And then we're using the flight uh, from the U.S., flying warbirds, military aircraft, um, across Siberia to Krasnyarsk as part of the documentary film process, but to help, you know, use that as a tool to tell this amazing story. Mm -hmm. Because ALSIB, it's, it's the initials for AL, AL for Alaska, and uh, SIB for Siberia, right? That, that is correct, yes. Okay, yes, I remember seeing the C-47 at the MAX Air Show in Moscow, in 2015 that was the end terminus right of the of the, of the expedition in uh, that, in 2015 that is that is correct yes that was the uh, the terminus of the of the 2015 project and that uh, that aircraft was uh, uh, flown and um, uh, maintained by Rosavia, uh, who was our partner on that that leg of the project, and uh, Craig and I were there too at Max Air Show, and we did um, did a press conference uh, uh, towards the end of the Max Air Show, a big one uh, with our team from Rosavia and uh, several others, and they actually handed uh, uh, one of those C-47s off to a uh, museum, a military aviation museum there, and uh, it was really quite a quite a celebration. So it's not a regular thing. 
Correct. It's not a regular thing. Um, so what we're doing this year is uh, we're, we're planning to do the flight uh, next year. But again, you know, we're gearing up for the documentary film production, too. So we'll have film crews and flight crews. And, uh, you know, we're again, the, the, the basic need right now is, is that we have to bring on um, sponsors and, and project donors, supporters. Uh, we're, we're a nonprofit organization here in the United States. So a bulk of our funding comes from either project sponsorship through corporations, major corporations, or uh, philanthropic uh, sources, donors, uh, just individuals who, you know, would like to help contribute to the project. So, so we, uh, we're, we're, kind of reset for 2020 and uh we're we're gearing up now for 2021 and uh, so we hope you know there's some uh, people out there that uh, want to take an interest in it and help help support this great project mm -hmm. and the, the organization through which you are managing this project is called the bravo 369 right that is correct. It's the Bravo 369 Flight Foundation. And um, people often ask us, uh, well, what does Bravo 369 mean? And it, it's kind of a bit of a part of the story of how we really uh, got into this project uh, in the first place. But originally, just uh, kind of the high level view of it. Um, I, many, many years ago, I was looking at doing a, a solo flight to Providenia, Russia, uh, in a uh, Boeing Stearman. And um, we were looking for some routes to uh, fly that airplane up through Alaska that were a little bit better than flying up the coast of Washington and, and going into Alaska where the weather's a lot worse. But the, um, the route that we, we actually ended up with was the Alaska-Siberia air route that we discovered. And we, we really knew nothing about this history of uh, the United States and the Soviet Union uh, being allies in this manner during World War II, as, as a lot of people are not really aware of it to this day. Uh, but anyway, uh, getting to Bra what Bravo 369 means is, is that there is a, um, a general aviation route that was established uh, several years ago in a cooperative effort between the United States and Russia, between Nome, Alaska and Providenia, Russia. And that air route was established to help foster the growth of general aviation uh, between uh, Alaska, United States, obviously, and, and, uh, and Russia. Um, so, you know, because this was going to be our first flight, flight and project, well, B-369 air route, as they call it, or Bravo 369, uh, had a special meaning to us. And so we named our organization after the uh, first air route that we were going to take to Russia. And you also have some partners on the Russian side as well, right? So you've got support from uh, local institutions, the Russian Geographical Society as well, and some other organizations? That's correct. And, and I'm going to let uh, Craig chime in here too, um, because we have established over the years a, a tremendous working relationship with the Russian government. And it all really started through the uh, consulate uh, in Seattle. Uh, and that was uh, Consul General Andrei Yushmanov. Um, and, uh, you know, through the, the work that we did with the consulate, really got the project and the um, information out to um, others in the Russian government. And there was a great deal of interest that was generated. And then eventually we uh, uh, found ourselves speaking with the Russian embassy, who was really being the liaison between us and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the FATA to help uh, uh, grow this this project and get you know the necessary permits and approvals that we needed to to fly across Russia. So Craig, you may want to may want to add on to that. One question: What's the F F T A F A T A? Oh, okay, uh, F A T A in uh, in Russia is actually it's the Federal Air Transport Agency. It's the equivalent of our F A A here in the United okay. States, or in Russia is known as Ras Aviatsiya. Okay, yes, yes. And so there's quite a process that, you know, you have to go through to um, get all of your, your flight and landing permits and things of that nature for each of the airports along the route. And, and we did find actually some more um, uh, resources that were able to help us because we're really considered as general aviation aircraft. And so uh, MAC, M-A-K, General Aviation Services in Moscow has a wonderful service that they have really stepped up and, and helped uh, general aviation pilots like us uh, with all the permits and the fuel logistics and everything of that nature uh, for, for people that are flying between the United States and, and Russia and, and other countries going into Russia too, not just the U.S. Yeah, I can imagine the, uh, 
the paperwork for <laughs> such an unusual flight and, <laughs> and, and coming through a direction that not many people are actually flying into Russia through through that area right so it's yeah a unique initiative. yeah you know and and with with aviation being the way it is um you know we're we're very used to you know just being able to go pretty much anywhere you know we want on a moment's notice uh, you know in our ga aircraft here in the united states but uh, um you know and then you know, same thing you know happens in in russia but when you when you do this exchange between countries and you're flying across international borders, you know, there's certainly a lot of restrictions, um, you know, paperwork and guidelines and things that you need to follow. And so very early on, we uh, recognized this and, and been working on it. And, you know, there, there are many layers of, of bureaucracy that you have to go through to, you know, give them your flight plan, you know, your intentions, really the timing of your flights in between airports and things of that nature. So it's, 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 can be a difficult process, but we found that um, uh, they have been very cooperative and very uh, helpful in getting us through this process. And uh, Mac General Aviation Services has really stepped up on our behalf uh, to help help with this process. Um, but I'd like to go back just a second because I think Craig uh, probably has something that he wants to discuss in terms of our relationship uh, that we built with the Russian government. And Craig, I think you're on mute there. Well, anyway, we can. We can wait for Craig to join. Okay, uh, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. Problems, I think. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Miguel. I'm sorry, I, yeah, I didn't no mean to problem. interrupt the flow here. No, I just wanted to ask you about the experience with the previous um, expedition in 2015, because you are you flew over areas of outstanding natural beauty, very uh, remote and um, with very large distances to be covered and actually some very limited infrastructure. I, I remember I wrote an article for CNN about the wooden airports of Russia and many of them were along this path you follow. And I, I have to thank you because you um, helped me uh, find some pictures uh, for some of these airports that are quite remote. Uh, so what was the experience like? I mean, you were flying for how long and how did you go about, where did you stop? How many people were you on board? All of these things. It, it, it sounds like a really interesting journey. Yeah, it, it really was, Miguel. Um, I, you know, I have to probably go back a little bit uh, just prior to 2015 and sort of how we, we got there. Um, Really, I think 20, the 2015 flight started during our 2013 test flight uh, to Alaska. And um, again, we were flying the uh, North American AT-6 Texan, and it was myself, uh, Alan Anders, uh, who is our flight operations uh, director for the project. Uh, we were in his T-6, and then Mark Candianus, who is a friend of ours uh, uh, here in Bellingham, Washington, that's also a T-6 pilot, but he flew support in his uh, Cessna 206, and so we, we affectionately called his uh, airplane the uh, chuck wagon. It's an old Western term about, you know, hauling, hauling supplies and uh, uh -huh. things of that nature. So we threw all of our bags and all of our, you know, provisions and everything in his 206, and, you know, he was our logistic supporter craft for that flight. But during, um, during the 2013 flight, we had put out a press release about the flight. Um, and we also, there was a, uh, a TV crew uh, from, uh, that came out of Washington, D.C., which was part of uh, RT, which was an, it was an RT uh, news crew that came out and actually did an interview with us in Seattle at the Museum of Flight as we were preparing to take off on our, our test flight. And so that segment was, was aired in Russia and particularly particularly in Moscow. And um, anyway, uh, the uh, folks from Rosavia picked up on the, the news broadcast and thought, wow, that's a really great project. And, and Rosavia, of course, uh, you know, they do a lot in capturing a lot of aviation history. They write a lot of books, uh, pr present a lot of really good materials uh, in Russia and in Russian aviation history. And so anyway, they saw the uh, interview and, and wanted to become part of the project. And so um, I was contacted, uh, actually we were in Dawson Creek, British Columbia, 
uh, when I got the email. And uh, they had invited us out to the Max Air Show uh, that year uh, after our flight was done. Of course, we, we couldn't make it. We, it was just a pretty short notice for us. But uh, anyway, we kept the dialogue going and um, came to uh, working on the 20. 20- uh, 2015 project. And so Rosavia uh, came on board and they did a tremendous job in helping to bring together the Russian side of the project. And so really, you know, we worked on the North American side and we worked with them on the Russian side. We were, of course, the lead because also, you know, was a, you know this this project, you know, was founded by Bravo 369. And, uh, but, but to join it, um, Rosavia uh, purchased a C-47, a couple C-47s actually, and uh, we met up in Great Falls, Montana for the, the 20, 2015 flight. So we had three T-6 Texans, we had two C-47s, uh, again, all aircraft that were provided to the Soviet Union during World War II under the Lend-Lease program. Sorry, uh, and, can I interrupt you here one second? Uh, to whom sure. do these planes belong? Do they belong to the foundation or they belong to other people? I, I didn't mm-hmm. really understand that. Right, so the C-47s belong to um, Rosavia. Uh, Bravo 369 owned one of the T6s, and then the other two T6s were privately owned. One one was owned by uh, our our flight director, Alan Anders, and then again, Mark Candianis, who joined us on the 2013 flight, had his T6 uh, there at Great Falls. But the only uh, T6 that actually went from Great Falls to uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, was the one I was piloting. So, you know, we had one T6 that, that went to Great Falls, but the other two, we all joined up at Great Falls for an air show that was happening uh, to, you know, celebrate the kickoff of this flight. So we all came together in, in one place. So it was two C-47s owned by Rosavia, one T6 owned by Bravo 369, and then two support T6s that uh, joined us in, um, in uh, Great Falls, Montana. Did you fly all together uh, as a flock? We did, yeah, we did. the uh, The T sixes flew together, and then uh, the the T sixes went out uh, together uh, when we were Craig and I were heading north, and and Craig was uh, flying with me. He was in the back seat of uh, our T six, and then uh, we had also one other aircraft that was a logistics aircraft that came along, and it wasn't um, a World War Two aircraft, but it was owned by one of our. Uh, board members, uh, former board members, uh, Alan Snowy, and it was a North American Navion, um, and it was uh, uh, a liaison aircraft that was used by the military, but it was uh, post, uh, definitely post-World War II, and uh, so anyway, we took off with our T-6 and the Navion as our logistics and support aircraft. Um, the C-47s flew later. Uh, one of the C-47s actually had to go a different route. Uh, because they had some problems with a couple of crew members being able to get entry visas into Canada. And um, so one of the C-47s took off uh, about a day behind us, uh, and they flew the route. And the first meetup that we had was in um, Edmonton, Alberta. And then we finally, you know, we we kept moving ahead um, because they had some mechanical problems in Edmonton. And then uh, we continued on and then met up with them uh, a few days later up in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, and then the, joined by the, the second C-47. Interesting. And how many days did the whole expedition uh, take? Uh, the North American, the North American uh, leg between, um, and, and I would say, you know, let, let's call it, you know, even though we're based in Bellingham, Washington, I consider that the, the flight actually started in Great Falls, Montana. Um, took us only five days to get up to uh, Fairbanks. Uh, we did encounter some really bad weather conditions uh, going through Alberta, and we were actually uh, weathered in at, at Edmonton for at least a day. I think it was about two days before we could take off again. And uh, so it kind of altered our, our plan just a little bit. Uh, but then we uh, kept going at a pretty good good pace. We were flying, uh, you know, two legs two legs a day and then ended up in Fairbanks uh, on a Friday. So we took off on a Monday out of um, Great Falls and then uh, got to Fairbanks uh, late uh, Friday afternoon, early evening that mm-hmm. week. And then uh, from Fairbanks uh, to Chukotka, it's a Russian 
side of the batting straight? You did it in one leg or? That, that was one leg. And so this is, this is where we, we had actually had to hand off the flight uh, to our uh, Russian partners. Um, because one of the problems that we had in 2015 uh, was being able to get uh, all the permits and everything that we needed to, to, to fly across Russia as an, as an American crew. And remember the geopolitical tensions that were going on in 2015. There was a lot of things that were going on, you know, due to uh, what was happening in, in Ukraine and, and Crimea at the time. Um, there was a lot of tension between the U.S. and in Russia in those days. And even though we had really great cooperation through the embassy, um, we just could not seem to get the permits needed to allow our crews to be able to fly across. So much like what happened in World War II, um, we handed the flight off to our, our Russian partners and then they took it from there to Krasnyarsk. Much like during World War II, uh, the American crews ferried the airplanes to Fairbanks and handed them off to the Soviet pilots to be ferried across the route to, from Fairbanks to uh, Krasnyarsk. It was a real treat oh, if, when it comes to recreation. <laughs> we, we had a really great celebration, too, at um, uh, Fairbanks. There's a, um, an Alsib Lend-Lease Memorial uh, right in downtown Fairbanks, Alaska. And you may have seen the statue. And it was um, uh, a creation and, and a project that was managed by uh, one of our, actually one of our subject matter experts and author, uh, Dr. Alexander Dolitsky. Um, he lives in um, uh, Juneau, Alaska, but uh, he uh, was a project manager on this uh, memorial. It's a really great memorial. And it, 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 basically is a statue of an American and a Russian pilot standing together. And uh, they're pointing back towards Great Falls, Montana, as if, you know, they're, they're watching airplanes coming into Fairbanks uh, to be delivered. It's a wonderful memorial. And so we had a, a ceremony there where we handed off the uh, 2015 flight to our Russian team, and they took it from there. So much like, you know, transferring aircraft to the Soviet pilots during World War II, we transferred the ELSIB 2015 flight to our Russian uh, team uh, right there at Fairbanks at the memorial. So it was really, it was a great ceremony. And, but did you continue as passengers? Did you we, to Russia? We, we did not, um, and um, unfortunately, we had to we had to go back. We had to turn the airplane around and, and go back to um, uh, our home base in, in Bellingham, Washington. That was really the terminus for us during the 2015 flight. And so, when I said earlier in the interview, you know, we have some unfinished business. The unfinished business is, you know, our American team flying all the way to Krasny Arsk to complete this. Um, this journey, but also too, it's the documentary film that's the big priority here to help tell this entire history about the Lend-Lease program, the cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States during World War II, and the transfer of these aircraft. And so, the flight that we plan to do next year, it's really it's a tool to help tell the story of this amazing and, and very much untold uh, history of World War II aviation. Mm -hmm. And how you plan to distribute this film? Is it going to be uh, available in, on some digital platform on, on in cinemas? Where? Yeah, it will. Uh, well, we what we plan to do is we have a really wonderful production company, and and we just actually did an interview with them just yesterday uh, on our podcast. Um, and uh, it's a, a company out of Ohio called Hemlock Films, and they've produced a number of really great aviation. World War II aviation documentaries that uh, uh, they've won actually won Emmy awards for their their work. Uh, they're going to join uh, they're going to join us in production. Uh, they're going to be the lead producers. And then what we hope to do is the first uh, film that's going to come out will be a a one hour film that uh, you know we hope to be able to to get out on a digital platform. Uh, we'd love to see it come up on, uh, you know, Netflix or Amazon Prime or something like that. And we'll, we'll work on that uh, down the road. Um, but this, this film, this one hour film, we hope will lead to a much bigger production, which will be a all encompassing uh, plan for a 12 part 
series on the entire history of the Alaska Siberia air route, Lend Lease, uh, the Soviet uh, side of the uh, the air route and that history. And, and bringing together all this work from some really great authors and subject matter experts that has, hasn't been widely distributed, bringing all this information and history together into one big documentary film uh, so we can finally get this uh, this history out there and get it told. And do you have already decided what's going to be the itinerary you're going to follow on the crossing to Russia? We, we have. Um, so, the of course, the North American route is, is very much established. And then um, once we get to uh, our final, final stopping place just for maintenance checks and uh, uh, fuel and, and uh, uh, getting you know our our final permission uh, to you know our final clearances to be able to, to cross into Russian airspace will be at Nome, Alaska, and so we will um, uh, cross the Bering Bering Sea, Bering Strait, uh, and and go right straight to Anadir uh, in the Chukotka region. And uh, in Chukotka, actually, we're also working with the uh, government of the Chukotka Autonomous Region and. Um, and being a part and involved in in uh, in our initial landings at uh, at Anadir uh, to do a celebration there. So from from there, um, I I've, we've got a couple of uh, alterations to our flight plan, uh, but it's going to generally follow the Alaska Siberia air route originally as it was as it was planned, and uh, we'll have those uh, those flight plans posted up on our our website. Um, so if you go actually go to our website at bravo369.org, we do have a map up there that shows the general uh, route of the Alaska Siberia Air Route. Thank so you. that's going to be generally the route that we will uh, we will use. This is going to be in summer because that's basically <laughs> because it, winter it can be very unforgiving, right? To fly in this very the unforgiving. Very unforgiving. You know, there's some incredible stories, Miguel, about the uh, pilots that flew across the route during World War II, both American and Soviet pilots, and during all kinds of really, really terrible weather conditions. And, and you know, for, for all of the other pilots that are out there listening to this, you know, here we are today, we have this wonderful technology with, with BS and, you know, all of the electronic navigation aids that at our disposal and digital knee pads, you know, uh, everybody's got, uh, you know, iPads and tablets that they use for their charts and their navigation, and you know we have all have modern avionics. Even in the in the warbirds, the old warbirds, we have you know upgraded avionics with all the modern stuff. But think about these guys during World War II that basically they were barely, barely, barely had a radio navigation system to fly in the United States, and and virtually nothing but just very crude charts, and so instrument flying conditions were really, you know, just based on, you know, compass headings, if you will. Um, later on, when the, um, the radio range beams came in, they called it flying the beam, but it was called an AN, so Alpha November radio range. Um, it was just a, a broadcast signal with a tone that told you if you were on course or off course. And um, that's what they had to fly. Uh, in terms of navigation. So if you got lost in the bad weather and, and you know, sub-zero temperatures, I mean, we're talking, you know, minus 30, minus 40 C, getting lost, ice fog, uh, just, you know, blizzard conditions, whatever. Um, the, the cold weather conditions were both tough, very tough on the aircraft and, and tough on the pilots because a lot of these airplanes didn't have any any cabin heat. And so you can imagine what it must have been like to, to fly and, and particularly the same conditions across Siberia. One of the stories that I always like to tell that really I think captures what the pilots went through flying during these really horrible winter conditions and, and conditions, weather conditions in general, going across uh, Siberia. Um, during our 2015 flight, we had a, a very small film crew that came along that was uh, supported. It was actually one of our, our sponsors, uh, Wargaming. Um, they, they had a film crew come along and they were going to produce a, a short film, which never 
never was uh, produced, but uh, um, I was looking at some of the B-roll footage uh, that they were showing from the flight, and they had interviewed a woman in Krasnyarsk, and she was a, a, a young lady at the time, and she's obviously in her 90s now uh, when they had interviewed her, uh, but she recalls the seeing the American planes coming into Krasnyarsk piloted by the Soviet pilots, and so these were, you know, Bell P-39 Air Cobras and P-63 King Cobras and North American B-25 Mitchell Bombers and, you know, a wide variety of different aircraft that, that we had uh, given to the Soviets. But anyway, she recalls um, one, one pilot in particular who got out after just a really horrible flight coming across Siberia in the winter. He basically said that you know, he wanted nothing more to do with ferrying airplanes across Siberia. He'd rather be sent to the battlefronts rather than ferry airplanes across Siberia in those weather conditions. So, you know, when when you sit back and think, you know, from a pilot's perspective, you think, well, flying an airplane is not that difficult. But when it gets so bad in those kinds of conditions that you'd rather go into battle where people are shooting at you <laughs> rather than, than staying in, in an aircraft flying across open country. Country, you know, and the weather conditions are so bad that you, you, you'd rather be sent into battle than fly that airplane. That's, yeah. that's an incredible story. Actually, I came across another story uh, in the same region, in the Krasnoyarsk region in the north, uh, which is in the Arctic area. Well, Krasnoyarsk region, it's, it's pretty big, um, but it has an area that goes all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. And that's a story I, I wrote about for, for CNN a couple of years ago. Because an old airliner, a C, it's actually a C-47, um, the Soviet version of the C-47, where I think it's called the Lizunov Li-2, which is basically Correct. like a C-47. And it, it crash-landed somewhere in the tundra in, in, in the Arctic. In, that was right after the war, I think. I think it was late 40s. Um, there was a whole story about how these passengers were saved after like one or two weeks there right the, this aircraft was actually salvaged and it's now at, at a museum in krasnoyarsk so there's a whole that's story right. about the, how they recovered this aircraft just a couple of years ago that's correct and um yeah and i, I want to add to that just a little bit too because i think that you know we have i i, I want to say that the lsip 2015 project was was probably something that you know inspired and I think motivated um, the investors and, and the Russian Geographic Society was a part of that recovery effort if I if I recall. But I think this whole ALSIB 2015 project because of the work you know and the and the uh, notoriety that it got in Russia uh, inspired some investors to come in and, and help fund that expedition to go in there and, and pull that airplane out. And I think it was a marvelous recovery effort. And the nice thing about, you know, if there's any nice thing about recovering an airplane that's crashed, at least up there, the conditions are so dry and cold that the aircraft are generally in still in really good condition with very little corrosion. And so the restorations are, uh, you know, restorations are, are much easier than they are trying to restore something that's been sitting in the bottom of a lake or, or down the bottom of the ocean. Um, but um, the, the point I was going to make is, is that one of the, one of the American crew, there was um, a father and son team uh, who actually owned one of the C-47s that went across the Alsip route in 2015 as part of our project, and uh, Frank and Glenn Moss, and they actually owned one of those C-47s, and they sold that to um, to Rosavia for the project. But um, Rosavia retained them to help, you know, train their crews and to help assist with the, the flying duties, you know, going across, because this was a relatively new aircraft to um, Rosavia's pilots and so they they hired uh Glenn and Frank to be part of those crews to you know make sure that you know they were being uh, being flown safely but anyway um so uh with Glenn's expertise uh, in DC3s here in the United States uh the C47 um he was actually part of that recovery crew uh that went up there and, and pulled that airplane out and so he's he's got definitely you know, got some really great stories to tell, I'm sure, about that. And uh, it was a remarkable recovery effort. I didn't know there was this link with your project, your own project, mm -hmm. and, and that recovery expedition. 
that yeah, I had the chance to research and I got some pictures from the Russian Geographical Society that Correct. was uh, in charge of coordinating this whole effort. So yeah, I'm mm-hmm. going to post a link to this article as well on the, on the podcast notes so that everyone can then see what we're talking about. Very good. So um, yeah, so we, we will have to wait to 2021 then to see the, the completion of this route, this expedition. And then, but then we are going to be able to just uh, watch it on our screens. Yeah, and um, yeah, that's correct, Miguel. I I really, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this project. And you know, we we're we're very steadfast in our our approach. We're, we're we don't give up on this thing. I mean, I think a lot of people at this point, after so many years, would have just said, you know, it, this is this is too difficult. And you know, we've we've got the credibility and we have the experience to to be able to do this. And now the only thing that's really standing in our way is 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 just getting uh, support in uh, financial support for the project. And um, one of the things that we've done to help create awareness uh, of the project, uh, rather than, you know, just trying to rely on press releases and and a couple of uh, media uh, blips, um, we've we've actually started a podcast as well, and it's called uh, Warplanes to Siberia, Flying the Route. And we're hoping to be able to launch that uh, sometime around the end of this month. And, and actually, we're going to target our, our 4th of July holiday, perhaps, to, to go ahead and, and launch it. And um, the idea behind the podcast is, is we're having discussions about this project just like we are today, but we're going a little bit deeper into the history um, of the Alaska-Siberia air route and the Lend-Lease program uh, between the United States and, and the Soviet Union. And we're talking about the, you know, modern-day cooperation, too, between us and the, uh, the Russian government. And uh, so I think, uh, I think the listeners out there, um, you know, will, will find that podcast informative. And we certainly hope that uh, anybody that's listening out there who is interested in this subject, uh, you know, please feel free to contact us if you're interested in, in supporting and Particularly for the corporate sponsors out there, we uh, we really uh, hope you'll consider coming on, and and we'd love to talk to you about the uh, name and brand recognition that, of course, you're going to get as being a part of this project and, and documentary film. So um, we're really hopeful that um, people will join and help us to uh, bring this untold story of World War II aviation history. Uh, let's bring it out there and let's make it a part of the permanent record now instead of, you know, some obscure story that, that rarely, rarely gets told. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can you please remind us where, the, where people can reach you out? It's, uh, the website is bravo369 in numbers.org. That, that is correct. Bravo and then the number 369.org. And then we have a, a new project website too that we've uh, just put up and it's warplanes to Siberia. Com. So again, that one, the project website is warplanes to siberia.com. That's where you're going to post the, the yeah, podcast. We'll post the podcast there. And then plus, uh, it'll probably uh, end up getting listed in uh, Apple Podcasts and or Google Podcasts, Apple, iTunes, uh, Spotify. Yeah. Um, all those, all that. those major, yeah. major things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, and I know Craig's been sitting back there patiently waiting. I see his mute button is still on. I don't know if he, he got his audio back or not, but uh, I, I feel like I've, I've taken some of his thunder away here. <laughs> so, Craig, I'd just like to have you say a few things if you, uh, if you got, got your audio back there. I am back, and uh, hopefully you can hear me just fine. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the great things uh, about the uh, the project is our ability to connect with people, and it's people in the United States, people in Canada, and people in Russia. And I've had the the great opportunity to speak at universities in the United States and Russia and share the story of Lend Lease and the Alsip program. And earlier you were talking about um, Krasnyarsk. And when I was doing a presentation uh, in San Diego, California, uh, several years back, there were uh, several Russian students in the audience. And one of them came up to me and told me the story of remembering her grandmother talking about American airplanes flying into Krasnyarsk. And she didn't understand. She couldn't fully conceive why American airplanes were flying into 
Krasniarsk. And when she saw our presentation and heard the speech, she comes up and goes, thank you. And she started crying because it, it brought this story to fruition. And this is just one small example. Uh, even when we were in Great Falls, Montana in 2015 at this air show, and we had uh, Ambassador Kislyak from Washington, D.C., and he says, I, I know of the cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union during the war years, but I did not know that Great Falls, Montana was the staging area in the United States. And so it's just the tip of the iceberg, and there's so many rich and wonderful stories that need to be told, and this is the time to do that. Yeah, definitely. I will encourage everyone to check your website, bravo369.org, um, warplanes2siberia.com or .org? Uh, dot .com. Dot dot .com. com. Yeah. And then you have ALSIB 2020 as well? Um, no, that one, uh, we, what we've done with that one is uh, that that uh, has been transferred into the Warplanes to Siberia uh, okay. Uh, okay. website. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to post links on the podcast notes so that everyone that is interested in this amazing story can check check it out. And uh, yeah, hopefully you will get uh, more, more uh, people interested, the sponsors and, and other people that are basically have an interest in, in, in this episode of World War II history. And also, well, looking forward to, to watching your documentary film whenever it is out. Well, we're looking forward to it, Miguel. Um, thank you very much for having us on your, your uh, podcast. And good luck with your podcast. I see you're, you're just getting started as well. So I Indeed. think we're, you know, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the podcasting uh, realm is a bit new to us, but we're, we're catching up to it quickly. And it's actually a lot of fun. And I, I think it's a really great thing that you're doing uh, to keep your, your listeners engaged. And I've and, uh, been enjoying your podcast as I've been listening to them. And certainly all the aspects of commercial aviation on an international level level so it's, yeah. it's really great to great to listen to yeah we'll be looking forward to listen to you to listening to your podcast as well when, when is it well, going to be out is a um we're planning to release it um as early as the end of this month so right around the uh, 30th of, of june uh but uh, you know since we have the july 4 holiday coming up uh, fourth of july independence day it seems maybe kind of a you know a great great date to, to pick to start so we'll we'll be announcing that soon but uh, yeah just be looking for us and we will uh, actually have um uh we do have a social media presence on Facebook and, and on Twitter. Um, and you can link up to that through our, our Bravo 369 or Warplanes to Siberia websites as well. Uh, well, we'll be putting out some announcements and I'll, I'll get them out to you as well. So you can uh, uh, link that into this, so this podcast. Looking forward. And thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Miguel. It's really great to uh, finally get to talk with you. I know we've been corresponding by email for over a year now, back and forth, and uh, sure appreciate your continued interest in our, our project. And uh, we're looking forward to having you come along, too, as uh, in reporting as we're going along this, uh, this incredible journey we're going to take next year. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Miguel. Bye. Bye.